thank you everybody my name is lindo i am with the marketing team at service CTO. Um, we're very very excited to be hosting this webinar today where we're going to be learning about the 2021 service CTO research grant experience um, with the lessons from academic researchers we have patrick as well as Louisa, who were our um, awardees for last year. And they'll be talking to us about their experiences as well as their research work. And we're very excited to hear about that. Um, so again, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, the event today is jam-packed with uh, really exciting presentations. Um, and so we're super excited for you all to be joining us. Um, the event is being recorded um, and all the resources that are being shared um, today will be provided after the um, after the event. Um, if you do have any questions or any problems, um, please I can continue to use the chat. Um, I will be starting us off with just a quick housekeeping for the event today, just to help everybody be comfortable with the Zoom platform. Um, and then after that, I will do a handoff to my colleague, Marta, who is going to be moderating our session today. Um, and she has the pleasure of introducing um, the presenters that we have today. Um, after that, we after the presentations, we are going to have a discussion portion. Um, this will just be a conversation between our moderator as well as our presenters. Um, and then that will be followed by a QA. and a um, And again, I'll give everyone just a sense of where the Q&A um, questions can be put in. Um, in just a second. Um, and then there's also going to be um, a post webinar survey that you all will see once you're done with this event. Um, and so let me get started here. As you all may see um, in the Zoom platform, so we have the chat that uh, some of you have kind of have been kind enough to already use. Um, that's where you can engage with um, other attendees. Um, again, continue to greet us. Um, if you recognize any names yeah, amongst the people who have joined us and you want to say hello, feel free to use the chat. Um, we are going to have a poll um, just before we start the presentations, which we will then discuss when we get to our discussion portion. And so please use the polls and quizzes um, to respond to our polls. We appreciate your participation. Um, and as I said, there is going to be a Q&A session at the end. And so please use the Q&A button um, to post your um, your questions there. Um, and then we will want, we will make sure that we answer them um, as they come um, throughout the event. Um, and so I think with that, I will hand over to my colleague, um, Marta, who will then start us off with uh, the presentations for today. Thank you, Linda. Hello, everyone. Welcome to, to this webinar. I think Linda already uh, did a great job introducing the webinar um, and uh, explaining the structure of the webinar. I just wanted to share with you that I also, I just launched a poll with two questions um, so that we can learn more from you and your experience with Survey CTO. So, um, just like uh, Lindo mentioned, feel free to click on the full icon and uh, answer to those two questions. So today we will have two uh, guests um, that won our research grant and they have been doing amazing research, which they will be presenting to us today. Our first guest uh, that I have the pleasure to uh, present is Luisa. Uh, and Luisa is a fifth year PhD candidate in the Department of Economics at UC, uh, UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on casual labor markets in low income countries, which employ most of the world's labor force. She is interested in understanding the determinants of labor supply when there are no formal contracts in place and how contracting frictions prevent skill upgrading in such markets. Luisa has spent most of her time um, as a grad student collecting primary data in India, Burundi and Kenya. Prior to the PhD, she completed a bachelor and a master's degree in economics at Bocconi University in Milan. Welcome, Luisa. Thank you so much for being here today. I think it's my first time presenting to so many uh, different countries at the same time, people from so many countries at the same time. So it's definitely it's exciting. And so thanks everybody for being here. One second, I'm gonna hide my meeting controls. 
So today I'm gonna to present uh, preliminary results from uh, um, my research project on approachability of returns to training as a barrier to technology adoption, evidence from Burundi. This is a joint project from uh, with Pedro Nasso, Michelle Armel and Ikeza, whom I believe uh, is joining us today um, in the audience, and uh, Nick Swanson. The policy, broad policy motivation for this project is that low um, agricultural productivity in Sub-Saharan Africa is particularly low, low compared to uh, the rest of the world. Um, many policymakers, as well as academic researchers, have focused on uh, the role of credit markets, information and risk markets in uh, low adoption of technology and consequently a uh, low level of productivity in Sub-Saharan Africa. However, in this project, we argue that labor markets also play a key role uh, in the uptake of agricultural technologies and illustrate uh, this point uh, through an example um, uh, in an RCT with, in Burundi with our partner organization, Waker Fund. Before I dive deeper to the, into the design of this project, let me uh, go quickly through the context. So um, we are going to focus on two programmatic uh, uh, technologies. So the first one is seeding technologies, which consists in the optimal uh, application of seed density on a plot um, to minimize competition of plants uh, um, for, of a, for like competition of a, for nutrients uh, among plants in a plot. And that said, dosage technologies consist in the small in the application of small quantities of fertilizer. Fertilizer consistently uh, through all the plot through through throughout the plot to promote efficient use of resources. Farmers in Burundi uh, seems to appreciate these technologies. However, um, adoption is not uh, uh, very high. And uh, when when asked why farmers report a, a whole series of constraints uh, um, that limit their adoption of these technologies, but one that uh, stand out in particular was the lack of uh, skilled laborers available for planting um, for helping farmers to plant at planting times using these modern technologies. This shortage of skilled laborers is also uh, testified by the wage premium that um, far that the laborers who know how to apply. Uh, these modern technologies uh, can earn at planting time. At the same time, uh, and somehow puzzling, puzzlingly, um, together with the shortage of skilled laborers, we also observe low level of training um, uh, of farm of uh, of laborers in these agricultural technologies. So these two facts: the shortage of skilled labor and uh, um, the lack of training in equilibrium, um, led us to develop our main hypothesis for this project which is that modern knowledge of modern planting techniques is what economists call the general skill. What is a general skill? Is a skill that is beneficial to many firms. And uh, economists have long posited that um, firms might underinvest in training of general skills uh, when, because they cannot appropriate the returns uh, of their investment. What do I mean by that? So let's say I'm a firm and I want to train my laborer um, in, a, in a general skill. Now my laborer becomes uh, marketable to many other firms. And so these other firms might come in and like offer a higher uh, wage to, my, to the laborers that I trained. And therefore I never, I'm never able to recoup the, my investment costs or perhaps the laborers chooses to stay with me but now demands a higher salary because they're what we call the outside option in the market has increased. So this is what um, we call the approvability of returns to training failure. And we argue like in this paper, we're gonna test um, this hypothesis, whether approvability, um, uh, like this failure to appropriate returns to training limit uh, training um, in modern agricultural technologies in Burundi and consequentially uh, the adoption of technologies. Um, we, we run a survey uh, showing that approvability, like reasons related to approvability failures are one of the main reasons why farmers don't uh, report not training laborers. Um, so sort of um, suggesting that our hypothesis has some, uh, has some uh, truth out there. And before I continue, let me summarize our research question. So first, we want to show that this failure to appropriate returns on training indeed um, reduces uh, training in modern agricultural technologies among farmers in Burundi. And then this uh, underinvestment in training reduces the adoption of profitable agricultural technologies because uh, skilled laborers are scarce. We try, we answer these questions through an RCT. So uh, we address the first question in two parts. 
So the what are, like the failure to appropriate returns from training, um, we show that this is the case in 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 two ways. First, we um, we design a treatment uh, where we provide financial incentives to to farmers to train laborers uh, from their villages in modern agricultural techniques. And this is to show that uh, um, once we increase uh, uh, this, the in treatment villages, um, when we increase the, the stock of skilled laborers, hiring of these skilled laborers increases not only among people that uh, train the laborers, but also among others that are uninvolved in training. So we show that there is an externality so that these skills benefits not only the trainers, but other people in the village. And then we we'll, uh, we tackle um, the, the our first question, introducing another arm, so what we call the labor insurance arm, that really shows that there is an appropriability failure, so that um, farmers do not train because they cannot appropriate the returns from training. And we do so by showing that once farmers are guaranteed that um, um, the laborers they train will show up, will come back uh, to work for them at planting time, they are now they now become willing to train the laborer. And then we answer uh, our second research question about technology adoption by showing that in treatment villages, um, once uh, the stock of skilled laborers increases, um, technology adoption also increases. Let me go um, quickly for the design. So our units of randomization are villages or sukolin in Burundi, and we focus on uh, um, one of the major cro uh, staple crops in Burundi, which is beans. In each village, we select uh, 20 farmers, what we call the trainers, who are clients of the One Acre Fund uh, um, NGO, uh, and who, are know, who know how to um, use these uh, technologies. And each of them selects a laborer from the same village who does not know the technology. In, uh, in the village, in the same villages, we also um, select uh, a, what we call a spillover sample um, that is composed by other farmers who are not involved in the training. So in all the treatment arms, uh, we ask uh, tra the, each trainer and trainee pair, so the farmers and the laborers they selected to come um, to participate to an event on a given day. And now, um, in the, in the control villages, the um, trainers are told that they can train the laborers if they want, um, the, the laborers they brought, in, uh, they brought if they want uh, in the technologies, but they will receive the financial incentive unconditioned. So they can decide to train or not, but they will re receive a financial incentive. By contrast, in treatment villages, what we call the uh, financial incentives villages, the trainers are told that they will receive a financial incentive only condition on training the labor in the technology. So this is the treatment I, I was uh, uh, mentioning before. And instead, in the um, labor insurance villages, we um, we tell the farmers, so the trainers, that they can they will not receive a financial incentive. But if they train uh, the laborer, we will guarantee that the laborer they, they trained will come back and work for them at plenty of time. Essentially, we will guarantee that they were going to be able to recoup the cost of training a laborer. Let me now show you quickly preliminary results before I run out of time. First, we show that uh, farmers, once in, 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 uh, in the financial incentive villages, um, when, when we give an incentive to train uh, to train a laborer, farmers indeed uh, uh, train the laborers according to our definition, which is spending at least 30, um, three hours with the trainee uh, under the supervision of um, enumerators. This was not super surprising because we were paying people to, to train, but what is a bit more surprising um, is that farmers um, are willing to train even without financial incentives when they can appropriate the returns from the training. So here on, in the graph, I'm plotting um, the share of farmers who train in the financial uh, uh, incentives village. So about 90% of people uh, chose to train. But in the, in the labor insurance village, when they were not receiving financial incentives to train, um, a, an equal uh, number of farmers decided to train their laborers, showing that indeed, once you guarantee uh, farmers that they can recoup the, the, their investment costs, uh, they are now become willing to train. And so this is to address this direct, more directly our uh, research question, whether there are um, appropriability uh, failures when it comes to training. So results number three, 
this training is effective in improving uh, farmer uh, laborer skills. So we have an incentivized measure um, to um, after after the, the, the event to measure whether laborers improve their skills. And, and we found that in three main villages, laborers now became better uh, at the trained skills. Result number four, uh, this uh, increase in skill led to a higher demand uh, of uh, a higher demand for the, the work of these trained laborers at plenty of time. So on the left, I'm showing you the number of days uh, uh, that the trainees uh, so were, were, were hired in, uh, in treatment versus control villages. So unsurprisingly, um, trained laborers were, were hired more uh, by, by the trainers in, in treatment villages because now they know that some skills that are valuable to the farmers. But also um, on the right, I'm showing you that uh, trained laborers were hired not only by the farmers who trained them, but also by other employers in the village. And this is what we, we interpret this as an evidence for our externalities. Um, so the skills are in the generals because they're beneficial to many, many other farmers in the village. Finally, result number five, uh, technology adoption. Um, this increased hiring of trained laborer uh, increased also uh, adoption of uh, the planting technologies. So the number of plots by, per farmer that were planting according to modern techniques increased both among farmers who provided the training and farmers involved in training. So I think, I believe I'm running out of time. So let me just conclude. I hope uh, to have showed you uh, a little bit that in our work we documented an externalities arising from training casual laborers, which is consequential for adoption of agricultural technologies. We claim that this externality contributes to low levels of training in equilibrium. Um, and this is policy implication um, because we should also consider labor market frictions when thinking about um, what prevents uh, adoption of new technologies. Thank you very much. I'd be really happy to hear your feedback. So I, I left you hear my email and the emails of my coffers. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much for um, sharing your work with us uh, and your contact details. We can also share your contact details with uh, the users after uh, in our follow-up email. Um, I also want to apologize everyone for the technical issues. There were some issues with the sound. Uh, but we will be providing the recording of the webinar afterwards, so don't worry about it. You will be able to, to, to watch the recording um, at any time after our events. Um, we will have more time to talk about um, Luisa's work during the Q&A session. But now I would love to introduce our second guest, Patrick. Um, Patrick is a sixth year PhD student in economics at Princeton. He is interested in studying supply and demand side barriers to human capital accumulation. Prior to Princeton, he did his undergraduate studies in St. Callen, Switzerland, and worked as a research fellow for Hoini Pande at Evidence for Policy Design at the Harvard Kennedy School. He has ongoing work in India, Peru, Chile, um, and the Dominican Republic. Welcome, Patrick. Hi, Marta Povic. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. Let me share my screen. Yeah, today I would like to talk about the effects of the Health and Wellness Center reform on patient and provider outcomes in Rajasthan. And to motivate that work, let me start by pointing out that in many low income countries, the healthcare market is characterized by low quality and high prices. In India, the setting of our study, only 50% of patients seek healthcare at government facilities. To the right, you see results from a recent nationwide survey in India, where respondents were asked why they don't seek health, public healthcare. And you see the common reasons mentioned were poor quality of care, long waiting times, and lack of nearby facilities. So in our project, we want to study whether a nationwide reform that aims to improve access to public primary health care can improve the health system and the overall market equilibrium. To do that, I will first uh, describe the typical patient choice of uh, a rural household in India before describing the reform more detail. 
for a typical patient, if he falls sick, he has two options for seeking care. Either he can travel to the nearest town to seek healthcare at a public provider. The public provider usually provides healthcare for free. However, as mentioned before, they are often unreliable due to like long waiting times, high absenteeism rates. And for these reasons, many patients instead prefer to seek healthcare from informal providers in their own village. When I'm talking about informal providers here, I mean these are private healthcare providers without a formal medical degree. Instead, these providers might have worked, for example, for a couple of years for another doctor and then started kind of their own small team. So a patient then has to make the trade off of whether to go to this informal provider with few qualifications, but who's located like close to their own home or to travel all the way to the official public doctor in the nearest town. Besides these two choices, many villages also have a public outpost, which are staffed by nurses to provide maternal and child care. And what the government of India is doing now is trying to upgrade these public outposts by adding semi-skilled workers to them to transform them into basic outpatient care centers. Let me talk about this in more detail. But to the right, you see kind of this maternal outpost, which I mentioned earlier. And what the government's doing is that they're adding a semi-skilled worker, a so-called community health officer to these facilities. These new workers, for example, have a bachelor degree in nursing community health. These are not full doctors, but they're still trained enough to kind of provide basic care and, for example, treat fever or diarrhea. So the insight here is that, especially if you're in a country which has shortages of doctors, you can provide basic care through kind of mid-level providers, uh, and those kind of overall decrease the pressure for higher level levels of care. Before the upgrades, these outputs focus on maternal child care. Once they have been upgraded, they, ex they expand the service which are available and also have a stronger focus on basic outpatient care. This means that a patient who now is getting sick in a village doesn't have to travel all the way to the nearest town to seek public health care, but they can also go to the outpost to seek at least basic care from the new mid-level provider. We already conducted a pilot study across 15 villages which received a new healthcare worker as part of a pilot program. To the left, you see the number of patients which uh, the facility saw before the worker started uh, to be posted there. On the average, a facility saw 100 patients per month. Once a new worker has been posted, the patient will increase to more than 370 patients per month emphasizing that there's strong demand for improved access to public health. In our research study, we're trying to answer the following research questions. First, does adding semi-skilled workers to remote government facilities improve the provision of public health care? If that is the case, we then want to understand whether this in turn creates competitive pressure for informal providers to improve the quality and decrease the prices. And such indirect effects can multiply them the overall effects of improving public health care. And finally, we want to understand what are the effects of reform on patient outcomes overall. To study um, these research questions, we collaborate with the government of Rajasthan in India and explore the staggered rollout of the reform using a difference in difference design. What I mean uh, with that is that it's not the case that all workers are posted at once, but instead they're posted over a three year period. So this gives us variation in when and where the new workers are posted. And we're collecting uh, information across 164 villages in Udapur district, one of the largest and poorest districts in Rajasthan. And half of these villages approximately now received a new provider recently. So this kind of allows us to compare how the reform affects our key outcomes. As part of our primary data collection, we took information on public providers, private providers, and households. For public and private providers, we took information on healthcare quality, patient load, availability of medicine and equipment. For private providers, we also, for example, ask about revenues and prices. On the household service, we mostly focus on healthcare utilization, 
health care spending and health outcomes. Besides our prime data collection, we're also going to supplement analysis with administrative data on monthly health indicators to look at the effects of reform for the entire state. This will allow us to see not just whether the effects hold in our sample area, but also kind of in a broader geographical uh, setting. Let me talk briefly about the time of our study. At this point, we just completed our baseline survey in last April. And in May, around half of our summer visions received these new CMS health workers. We now plan to go back this winter to collect the data again from the providers and from households to see how the key outcomes have changed before in May, the next batch of workers will be posted. A key element of our study is the measurement of healthcare quality. To do that, we are going to follow existing studies and use so-called medical vignettes to measure quality. In vignettes, providers are given basic patient description, and then they need to ask questions to identify the correct diagnosis and treatment. We use two vignettes. One is child dysentery, and one is adult asthma. An example, for example, is that we would kind of go to the provider and say, imagine a patient comes who has breathing problems. Then the provider has to ask correct questions to differentiate whether these breathing problems are driven by asthma, by pneumonia, or by allergies or any other reasons. To do that, we need to pre-code more than 100 plus questions and corresponding answers to make sure that our answers would lead the provider to the unique diagnosis. And this is kind of like a common measure of like health quality in literature. And the good thing about service CDO is that it allowed us to generally pull the relevant options and overall those improving the flow and making the interactions much more natural. Let me now show you kind of the key results we have from our baseline survey. First of all, our findings show the need for the reform. The existing nurses are often overworked and also need additional training. We find that more than 70% of them say that too much work is allocated to them. And also more than 70% say they would require additional training to do all the tasks which are allocated to them. When we measure the knowledge of these nurses, we find that they know how to add basic care to children but they struggled with more complex illnesses like adult asthma. In addition, we see that public health utilization is relatively low and out of pocket expenses are high. On average, households spend 18% of their monthly income on medical expenses. Finally, we also observe that private providers in the village have an average profit margin of 39%. This suggests that they have local market power and that by improving public health care, they might all start to react by from a lower to lower prices or to increase. However, we also see the additional infrastructure and medicine might be needed to reap the full benefits of the reform. 60% of the nurses that we survey say that poor infrastructure prevents them from doing their work adequately. More than 60% of the facilities in our sample don't have electricity, uh, sorry, only Two thirds of, of electricity of the system our sample have electricity, and a bit more than one third of running water. So there are still substantial gaps in the infrastructure. And when asked about essential trucks, we also find shortages there. For example, more than ten percent did not have like basic antibiotics, like ciprofloxacin, at the point of the survey. To conclude, in our project, we are studying whether adding semi-skilled workers to government facilities can improve public health care and can regulate the private sector. Similar reforms can also be effective for other low-income countries. Such policies might even pay for itself once you account for lower public health expenses and even increase tax revenues in the long run. The idea here is that, for example, then you, this government has like fewer uh, health insurance uh, payments in, in the long run, as well as, for example, a better, more able workforce, which will also in the end pay higher income taxes. However, such reform, especially such labor inputs, should be accompanied by infrastructure investments to ensure that the full potential uh, of such interventions is reached. That's everything I have for today. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your presentation. Mm -hmm.
Um, let me share my screen now. Thank you, both of you. Um, we, I already, I can see that we already have a couple of uh, questions for you for the Q&A session. Uh, but before going to the Q&A, I would really love to learn a bit more about your survey CTO experience in specific. Um, and I will make use of our poll. I see that a lot of people have answered to our questions, so thank you so much. I'll end the poll now and we'll share the results with everyone. Um, I can see that based on our, our audience, we have um, more or less half of, of our attendees are either new to service CTO or are exploring service CTO suitability for their projects. So one of my questions uh, are, uh, if you had any experience with service CTO before this project, um, and if not, what, which resources did you find more helpful for you to learn service CTO or what was your learning style? Um, even if you had experience with service CTO, I imagine that you had to learn specific features um, to adjust the tool to, to your research. So I would begin to hear your onboarding experience and learning experience with the platform. Should I start? Yeah, go ahead, yeah, boys. Cool. Uh, thanks for your question. I did have some previous exposure to service CTO um, for another project that I was working on in India. And, but definitely I had to uh, up my game for this project. So I mostly, so I found the online resources that service CTO provides very useful and in particular the template um, forms. So I, I could, I program the surveys using the Excel uh, feature. And there are a bunch of resources, especially for some specific topic. I remember when I had to learn doing repeats groups, uh, I used some of those resources. I think that was by far the most useful um, tool that I used to get started. And, and then for specific questions that I had, uh, I usually Google and like the, the website provides so many nice resources. And so, I mean, they explain you step by step how how to go about. So I, at the beginning, I used one of the sample forms to get started, and I think I followed the uh, webinar, like the um, online course, to get started. And then as as every time I need one extra feature, I go, I download the the sample form, and I practice using that. So yeah, that was my <laughs> I'm a strong believer of learning by doing. So that was uh, how I got started and how I continue. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think a lot of our users are, are um, uh, prefer to learn by doing um, because usually that's what you are doing when you are learning service CTO. You already have a research, you already have a goal, and you need to achieve that goal in a strict timeline. Um, so, just to expand on your on your answer, just to to, to let everyone know. In Service CTO, we have a very comprehensive product documentation, which is like a manual of our platform. And you can find all the explanation of all features. Um, and you can also find some sample forms when we are explaining specific features. Um, besides the product documentation, we also have the support center where we have some articles on tips and tricks, use cases, or guides on specific a uh, feature like choice filters, um, relevance expressions, constraints, and we are actually creating one right now on repeat groups as well. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Definitely a great way to 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 learn service CTO. I'm wondering about you, Patrick. Yeah, um, I had a very similar experience than Luisa. So in, I also kind of worked before. I was like my previous kind of advisor, a research project, and it's kind of. Uh, how I got to know service DO. The good thing there is often by working with like experienced researchers, they also have their own like service DO templates from existing projects. So you have kind of on the one hand, you have kind of the amazing kind of uh, yeah, documentation tools kind of for service DO, but then you also kind of have your friends and like previous researchers who also have like templates. And then often kind of the combination of the two of them was like really happy to like get started. Um, Yes, I guess this, but everything else is already mentioned. It's like, 
kind of the beginnings. I started with kind of very basic kind of form to just kind of learn the logic of logical steps. And later on, once getting a kind of more complex task, it's either I ask kind of friends who already kind of face some issues in their kind of survey questions on certain modules, or kind of I go to the kind of documentation center to see uh, if there's any advice. Yeah, thank you. And also to, to share a bit more on those sample forms that exist. Uh, we are still creating a lot of, we have a lot of sample forms because we have been supporting our users for a long, long time. And we have been creating a lot of sample forms to support our users in our support center. And a lot of the sample forms are not yet public. We are still creating a lot of content to share all the sample forms we have. So if anyone that is listening to us and have a struggle, you can, if, and if you are a paid user or a trial user, you can reach out to the, to survey CTO support um, and the customer success team will support you and will share any survey CTO sample form or template that we have um, that could be helpful for you. So yeah, thank you. Um, that was really helpful to learn. Um, the other question that I had was, what uh, was the feature or features um, you thought was more helpful for your project in specific? Yeah, I, mean, I can start this time. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, besides the one I mentioned in my presentation, which was dynamic filtering, which really made this kind of medical vignettes much easier. I think things which were helpful for me are GPS collection. So I needed to know exactly kind of where the providers are located. So this was something that was always very helpful. Um, audio recording. So uh, being able to audio record the service is really an easy tool to then afterwards check the quality, especially during kind of the first two or three weeks data collection, provide that kind of intensive feedback to surveyors. Um, so I think these are kind of some of the key features, which I think are really helpful. Uh, finally, I think for the phone survey, which we did for households, there's also an indication of Exotel. So there is a nice thing is that uh, kind of we had phone numbers, which we received kind of from government data. But in that case, we didn't want to share these phone numbers with our um, survey team. So the good thing about like Exotel is that we, the surveys just in the end are seen kind of the household ID. And then actually automatic calls these households without ever kind of seeing the phone numbers. So kind of we can still protect like patient or like household data, uh, but still being able to kind of reach them to like samples or call center. Oh, yeah, so I think such a really, really, yeah. a really beneficial. Yeah, thank you. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And about the Exotel integration. So we, uh, since COVID-19, a, lo a lot of organizations have been switching for uh, CATI phone surveys. Um, and we have been changing a lot our product roadmap uh, to adjust to CATI surveys and for our users to be able to conduct phone surveys in the, uh, the best way possible. Uh, we have a, a starter kit in our support center. Um, and actually you can conduct phone calls in Survey CTO Collect app, uh, but you uh, there are also integrations with Exotel, which is amazing for India. But if other users are not in India, uh, we also have an integration with Twilio. Uh, uh, these, these are softwares for mostly used for call centers. You know, if you are conducting phone surveys and you need to uh, contact a, a lot of people or even send SMSs, for example, in bulk, uh, these are excellent alternatives for users. Thank you. Yeah, I think I shared all of the features that uh, Patrick mentioned. Not only for this project, I have other projects that use service TO. The Exotel one uh, has been very helpful. Um, I think for this specific research, it, what I use a lot, a lot, a lot are pre-fields, so survey pre-fields, the ability to load in the data set, like uh, external data sets, and this is because I, my studies like follows farmers um, over a period of time, so we did a baseline survey, and then we have a, we had a planting survey, we're now launching the harvest survey, and then we're going to do post, uh, like follow-up surveys. And so the ability to like have the information loaded, um, like to make sure that we're serving the, the, the same person we were supposed to survey or like to uh, implement data checks. So for instance, if last time they told us they, are, they planted eight plots with beans, the next time we're able to like make sure that um, 
they, they, the answers are consistent to previous questions. So these are, I, I feel like I've been using survey prefills a lot, a lot, a lot, and, and it's really invaluable. Um, so yeah, I think in addition to what Pat said, uh, sorry, um, Patrick said the uh, prefills have been definitely useful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, preloading pre data is usually very helpful for for projects that are using multiple surveys for the same respondents or for longitudinal surveys where you have different st stages um, and you need to cross check information. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and I can mention one on pre field. Uh, yeah. So this is again not for this project, but um, cloud pre field. So cloud publishing cloud data. Um, so the ability to load the data from, uh, uh, like use dynamically the data that you're collect collecting to create inputs for the next, next survey is invaluable. So I have another project where like data are collected on a daily basis. And so we need the previous day's information for the next day's questions. Um, that has been a feature we discovered like recently with my team and it's been like life, life changing. So uh, yeah, I think this makes, Survey City one of the best products for data collection when there are longitudinal data. Thank you. Yeah, that's so sweet. So you mean server data sets? So publishing form data into a server data set and then yes. being able to preload yes. data from the server yeah. data set. Yeah. 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 That's um amazingly flexible and useful for, for so many use cases. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um and so Considering that we have, let me see, we uh, around 30% of our audience are undergraduate researchers. So maybe people that are in your position. Um, I was also wondering if you had any advice or su suggestions for these group of people um, that are looking to conduct primary data collection or are considering using Survey CTO for their data collection. Should I go first? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I think they're like, more in general, when doing data, I, learning from experience, I would say the most important thing when doing data collection is uh, piloting your survey instrument over and over and over and check the data when they come in, like making sure that the questions are understood as, as uh, you meant them to be understood. Um, and then I would probably, specifically to survey CTO, I found it, very tempting at the beginning to use this survey interface, uh, like the online interface. But I found that um, I, I would say spend a little bit of time learning how to program the, the Excel, like through using Excel, and that will will be will be very beneficial in the long like long run. Um, if you think that you're gonna do a lot of surveys, then it's a useful investment to do. I think. I don't know if you have uh, used our form inspector. I don't know if that's what you mean by online survey, but um, in survey CTO, when you are testing, um, so usually you, you can even use a spreadsheet form definition to design your form, but eventually you need to deploy the form in the server. Um, and when you are testing and making sure that all the fields have the right relevance, have the right constraints, um, they, they are clear, um, there are no bugs in the form design. We have a feature um, inside our test view, which is called the form inspector, uh, where you could go through field by field and look into all the things that are in the back end of the design and are hidden. You can take a look at the calculate fields and how they are performing. You can take a look at the expressions, uh, the field properties that are helpful to you, and you can change those directly in the form inspector. I don't know if you if you have used this feature. Yeah, yeah, I was referring to that. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can both. Uh, yeah, like when you 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 see that the data are not showing up as you expected, you I usually go on and like check what are, what are the mistakes I'm making and why is that uh, relevance not showing up and uh, it's definitely helpful um, to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Patrick, what about you? Yeah, I definitely second the parts of piloting. I guess piloting is like always key. Um, besides that, also training of surveyors. I think once you're at the point where you start hiring, 
you really want to get started immediately, but it's like, no, it's always valuable to like, not just kind of train servers in theory and how this questionnaire works, but also kind of have the time for field practice, maybe doing a false start out of your sample, just to really ensure kind of that, uh, first of all, that the servers really understand, the key team understands each question. Um, besides that, also like just by doing the training part, also kind of the field team has also extreme expertise about kind of the local situation, about maybe situation which can come up. So kind of really kind of spending time to the training component is important to like ensure high quality data collection. Um, one thing which I guess I also kind of learned over time is uh, learning, trying to do as many checks as possible as all these part of the survey. This could be either be hard checks, like saying, okay, maybe certain income values are like implausible because they're too high or even if it's like just unrealistically high, just have like a soft check. It's like allow the, allow the entry, but then a follow-up question and ask survey, are you sure you created it created correctly or did you accidentally like add a zero too much? So this kind of really reduce the headache exposed to then clean the data. So kind of try as much as possible to like ensure data quality at the point of data collection. Thank you. Okay. And I see that we are almost reaching the the at the end so let me be quick and so we can move on to the q a and see what our users are uh, asking before going to the q a let me just very very briefly and quickly um share a few things on the survey cto side um, if you have survey cto related questions that are not related to this webinar in specific, feel free to reach out to customer support via our support center. Um, if you are not yet a Survey CTO subscriber but are interested in Survey CTO, um, you can reach out to Maria from the sales team. She is very responsive and she will be able to help you with any questions that you might have. Um, I would also like to invite you for our next event next month on the 3rd of August. Um, we will have World Bank researchers uh, that will present to us their uh, dashboards for uh, data quality control. Um, Lindo will paste the, uh, the link to register to the, the events in the chat, um, but you will also, you can also follow us on social media um, to um, receive um, any product updates and updates on these kind of events as well. Thank you.